Lord God, I, I pray that you will do a great work right now. Lord, I pray that you will do a work that's way beyond, way beyond anything that, that we've planned. Lord God, just speak to us clearly. Uh, Holy Spirit, we just invite you into this place and, and just to take over as, as your word is looked at and, and, and opened up, Lord. Um, challenge us, encourage us, convict us. Um, you know where we are. Uh, you are here. And, and, and Lord God, just, just, just move in us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I was, I was at a birthday party. I was about 11 or 12 years old. And um, we had this really, really great game. When, it, when a new person would walk in the door, we would hide one of the kids that was there. Okay, you guys got this? And then three or four of us would talk bad about the person who was hiding to see if the new person walking in would talk bad about them as well. Great game. Okay? No, don't ever. This is a terrible game. Seriously. Like, how vicious is that? All right. Well, we, we learned quickly a couple things. We learned quickly that it was bad for both people. It was bad for the one hiding when they're like, yeah, I don't like that person either. You know, what? what? I'm here. You know? And, and then it was bad for the person that was kind of being tested or challenged and all those kind of things. But, but, but this is what was made clear within it, is that when, if, if, if the new person coming in knew that the person that we were talking about was in the room, they would act and behave differently. See, we act and behave differently when, the, when there is somebody in the room. When, when there is a presence in the room. You're watching TV. And, and all of a sudden you're watching a show and you're like, I probably shouldn't be watching this show, but you just keep watching the show. And then dad walks into the room. <laughs> Wasn't watching anything, dad, just clicking the jails. It starts at five, by the way. Michael was doing this the other day. I was like, what is up with that? Anyway, um, so I mean, it, it changes, right? You're, you're looking at something or you're doing something. Somebody walks in and all of a sudden it's like, and that's most of you, for most of you, that's your view of God. Most of you, when I, when I talk about God is here, God is present, God is with you all the time, most of us go, oh no, what am I doing now? But, but I want you to think about this. You know like when you're on an a, a athletic team and um, you're, it's like the championship game and you're warming up. And the best player's not there yet. And there's that feeling of like, oh man. I mean, as a coach, I fix <laughs> are, are they going to show up? And then they show up and you're like, woo! You know what I mean, right? There's like, yes! You know, the person's here, right? The best player on the team is here. Have you ever thought about that with God? When, when, when my dad is just something, even, even at the age of 38... When my dad is with me, when he's in the room, all, all is okay. Why is that? I don't know. But his presence makes a difference, even at 38. I'm like, wow, God, I mean, dad's here. Everything will be okay. It'll be okay. When my wife, when I'm in the room with my wife, there is like this joy. There's like this depth of intimacy when my wife walks into the room. It's unlike anybody else walking in the room. You know what I'm saying? And, it, and it's the, that sweetness when my kids walk into the room. Uh, when, when a friend walks in a room that loves you, that's in your encouragement, there, there's like something in you that is just lifted up. Well, I've got great news. God is here. Yeah, God is alive and God is here. And it's not like, oh no. If you go like this, most likely you're doing something wrong. God is here. That's great news. I mean, I mean, think about this as, as, as Christians. Think about what we believe. Because this is, this is different from, from what every other religion has. It, it, it thinks about it. See, we believe that God is in this room right now. The, the Word of God says, For where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. Now, now, now think about that. When it comes to worshiping and participating in the worship service. 
Right? Oh, man, Jeremiah's voice. Jeremiah's voice, it, it's a little bit high than, man, what I really like. And In fact, Jeremiah and I were talking. Where is Jeremiah? He's not even here. He's like, whatever. Oh, he's here. Thank you. All right, so, <laughs> I'm kidding, dude. I love it. So Jeremiah, we're talking to the other like week. He's like, yeah, my voice is kind of in this weird place between a what and a what? Oh, soprano and tenor or something like that? He's like, I mean, and it's like, you know what? Your worship should not be dependent upon who's up here. God is here. God is here. We believe that God watches over us. I mean, how awesome is that? That there's nothing that comes your way that God has not seen. That God cannot stop. That God cannot change. We believe that God dwells inside of us. It's one of the reasons why we changed our name to the sanctuary. Because as, as we grow and as we move, as we possibly look at a building, as, or whatever it is, that doesn't matter. God dwells right here, right now, and in you. We believe there's no place that we can hide from God. And once again, usually we think, oh, like I need to hide from God because I'm doing something wrong. I mean, praise God that there's no place that you can hide from God. When you feel at your worst, there's no place that you can hide from God. Because God is here. He's here. And, and because of God's presence being here, it should change the way you act and behave. It should change your mood. It should change how you feel. It should change how you experience every situation. Just think about when you face a tough situation. When, when, when you're at this place where you're like, man, I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how this is going to overcome. God's here. God's here. God's here. Even in the midst of sin. Rather than thinking of God being like this this, this God who you should be like, you know, oh my goodness, he's watching. God loves you so much that he's going, why are you doing that? That's only going to lead to misery in your life. That is only going to lead to destruction. That is only going to lead to death. That is only going to lead to division. That is only going to lead to divorce. That is only going to lead to all these things. Why are you doing that? God is here. And therefore... We should live, we should live in that joy and in that presence every single day. Turn to John 11. Turn to John 11. This takes place uh, later in the, in the life of Jesus. Uh, Jesus knows he's about to die. And, and, and here's one of the coolest parts about this whole thing. The crowds are divided upon who Jesus is, all right? There's people who want to kill him and there's people who want to follow him. I mean, just think about the tension in the air. I love it. Right? I mean, there's people like Jesus, we are all for you. And then there's people that are picking up stones literally and ready to stone him down. All right? It's, it's in the midst of all this that, that, that John 11 is written. Let's, let's start reading the word. John 11, starting at verse 1. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick, and he was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And this Mary, whose, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. Go back and read about that. It's, I mean, the intimacy of relationship that Jesus has with Lazarus, Martha, and Mary is awesome. All right? So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Jesus says, this is one, your friend is sick. And when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. And Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you were going back there? Let me tell you something. God is here, and therefore expect the unexpected. Expect the unexpected. The unexpected is coming your way. Expect it. All right? Look, look at what happened with Jesus in, in, in just these first eight, verse, first eight verses. All right? What, what happens that is so unexpected is that Jesus is willing to go to a, back to a place where he was just about to be stoned. Does that make sense? I mean, that, that's kind of weird. 
You, know, you, you wouldn't, you know, if, if you were in this story and, and you were like, hey, let's go back to the place that they almost just killed you. You know, they had the gun at your head and all this kind of stuff. And let's go back there. You'd most likely respond, yeah, let's don't go back there. Right? But Jesus does the unexpected. Let's go back. Let's go do it. He also does something else that's so unexpected in the story. And that is, he waits. I mean, what's up with that? He uh, Jesus, uh, Lazarus is, is really sick. He's dying. He's your friend. You love his sisters. You love him. What would you do? What would you expect Jesus to do? I would expect Jesus to go. I would expect Jesus to run to see Lazarus and heal him. Jesus waits. Totally unexpected. Totally unexpected. As a follower of Jesus, expect the unexpected. As a follower of Jesus, at least for me, um, listen to this. Because God is here, life will not go as you have planned. See, we think the opposite. We think, well, God is here. He's in my life. Now my plan that I've got for my life is going to be all laid out. It's sweet. I'm so glad I got God on my side. This is great. I'm a Christian now, and now life can go exactly as I planned. I've got small this money saved, and I got this nice little account of 401k. And I, it, like we're just gonna go here, and then we're gonna move here, and I got the, my, I'm just gonna keep growing in the business, and I'll make more money, and we get a bigger house, and I mean, gee, and I got because I got Jesus. No, <laughs> expect the unexpected, because this is what Jesus said to every one of his disciples. Jesus said, "What? Follow me. Follow me. Follow me." And I don't know about you, but if you're just going to follow somebody, you're going to come across things that are unexpected. Expect the unexpected. Why? Because God is here. And let me tell you something. It's the greatest adventure you can be on. Some of the greatest things in my life have happened, and they were unexpected. Let me tell you about, other than salvation, the greatest thing has ever happened to me. I'm sitting at Honey Rock Camp. And, and, and I, was a, I was a counselor at Honey Rock Camp. And I'm sitting around the circle, and this person is doing a devotional. And they talk about being a camp couple. They're like, oh, yeah, we fell in love at Honey Rock Camp, and it was so nice. And, oh, he's so cute. And, oh, and he was, she was hot. And, and oh, and, all the, and God just brought us all together. I'm sitting there like, oh, my word. <laughs> like, this is terrible. I mean, I am, that is great. In fact, the reason why I went to Honey Rock is it was a guy's summer. Seriously, me and my best friend were like, we're growing the goatees, no women, no girls, no dating. We are it, baby. And I'm like, yeah. Little did I know that Michelle is sitting across, listening to the same devotional, saying the same thing, right? Saying the same thing. This is gross. Who in the world would be in a camp couple? That is so weird. And little do we know that by the end of the summer, end of the summer, we were dating, kind of. <laughs> Expect the unexpected. That's just, that's just God. I mean, seriously, as I look back at my life, some of the greatest things that ever happened in my life are the, being a pastor, never expected to be a pastor, never wanted to be a pastor. I was thinking business world. I was thinking, honestly, lots of money, being a good guy, being a churchgoer, all those kind of things. God said, yeah, no. Planning a church? What, are you crazy? Expect the unexpected. And embrace it, people. Don't like, ugh. Embrace the adventure. I mean, it's awesome. All right. God is here, therefore expect the unexpected. And number two, anything, anything can happen. Look at verse 17, chapter 11, verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles away from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my my brother would not have died. Jesus, if, if you would have been here, how many times do we say that? God, if you, if, man, if you would have been here, 
I mean, if you would have shown up in my situation, it would be all different now. Look at what Mary says in verse 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she falls at his feet and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you just would have been here. I mean, it just doesn't seem like you're here. If you would have come, if you would have been here, I don't know about you, but I've, I've been there. I've asked those questions. Look at, look at what happens in the text. Back to verse 21. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, well, I know he will rise again in the resurrection the last day. I know that. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe it? Do you believe that God can do anything in your situation right now? God can do anything. He is here. He can do anything. Do you believe? He can help you overcome the sin that you struggle with. He can help you overcome just the struggle and tension that you experience in marriage. God can do anything. And and you know why God can do anything? Don't miss this in the text. God can do anything because of who he is. See, if if you look at the text, Jesus says what? I am the resurrection. Jesus doesn't say, I can do resurrections. Jesus doesn't say, I can bring people back to life. You want to see what I can do? Jesus says, I am. I am the resurrection. And because of who God is, because of who Jesus is, he can't do anything. Don't get it mixed up. See, the reason why we can have hope in in that God can do anything is because of who he is. Not just what he can do. It's because of who he is that he can do anything. Embrace that. Why do you have hope? Not just because Jesus forgives, but because he is the forgiver. Why do you have hope in life after death? Not just because Jesus saves, because he is your savior. Not not, not, not does he just pay back, you know, redeem. He he doesn't just redeem you, right? He, He is the redeemer. It's because of who he is that God can do anything in your life. That's your hope. God is here. He's here. And he can do anything. Expect the unexpected. Anything can happen. And and, and number three. You have a champion. You have a champion. Look at this incredible picture of Jesus. Jesus. John chapter 11, starting in verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping, and and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord. They, They replied, Jesus wept. And then the Jews said, see how he loved him. When you, when you look and you, and you begin to break down this verse, when, when, when I saw deeply moved, when, 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 when I saw the, you know, the words Jesus wept, what, what I thought about is, is, wow, look at the compassion of Jesus. Look at how he, like, like the Jews, look at how he loved 
But when, 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 you, get, when you get into this verse, right, when, when you begin to, to, to take it apart, when, when you begin to see what is Jesus talking about, what is the Word of God talking about when he says, deeply moved, let me, there's this quote, there's this quote by B.B. Warfield. Let me, let me say this. This is, this is where it happens. Hopefully you have it. Hopefully you have it. This is what he says. B.B. Warfield says this. It is death that is the object of his wrath, and behind death, him who has the power of death, and whom he has come into the world to destroy. Tears of sympathy may fill his eyes, but this is incidental. His soul is held by rage, and he advances to the tomb in Calvin's words as a champion who prepares for conflict. What an incredible picture of Jesus. We, 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 we think, I, I thought of, of Jesus kind of coming to the tomb like, oh man, Lazarus is dead, and I hope people believe, and I'm deeply moved. And I, and I, and Jesus comes to the tomb of Lazarus as a champion, ready for conflict, ready to do battle. It, it's, like, it's like David coming before Goliath. Jesus now comes as your champion before death. The, the, the enemy that we face, and not only death, but the one who brings death, which is Satan. And Jesus is your champion. And, and he comes before this as your champion. God is here. You have a champion. We have a video for you. I want you to just watch this video. It, it, it's a testimony of a guy named Zach Smith. And, uh, well, he'll, he'll tell a story. Hi, my name is Zach Smith, and I am 33 years old. I've been married to my beautiful wife, Mandy, for 11 years. We have three children, Lizzie, Jake, and Luke. And this is my story. I met Jesus when I was five years old. I grew up as the son of missionary parents in Ecuador, where I lived for 15 years. I went to college in Arizona where I met my wife. For the next 10 years, we traveled around while I worked in the information technology field. We served in our local church and I attended seminary. I often thought about working in full-time ministry, but no opportunities seemed right. I was told about a job here at New Spring Church helping with information technology. It was perfect, an IT job at an amazing church. I took the job and started working in October of 2008. For several months, life was very good, and we were very happy. In May of 2009, at age 32, I was diagnosed with stage 4 colon cancer. Immediately, I had surgery to remove a foot and a half of my large intestine and a lemon-sized tumor. I was told that cancer had spread to my spleen and to my liver. Chemotherapy was on the horizon. This was all a very sudden shock to me. I had always been very healthy, and I found myself very confused. Why did I have cancer? Had I done something wrong to cause it? Was this a result of many years of sinful living in my past? I was working at a church and serving God. Where did I go wrong? But thankfully, the confusion quickly turned to hope. I knew that God had a plan for my life. I did not understand why I had cancer, but I knew that God was in charge. For three months, I underwent a horrible chemo regimen. Afterwards, I had a scan done, and the results were great. There was no cancer found in my body. We celebrated God's healing and God's faithfulness. And the next few weeks of my life were some of the best, as I celebrated being cancer-free. But another scan one month later showed that the cancer had reappeared, this time in my abdominal cavity. I was devastated. Why was it back? Everything was just starting to make sense, but the reoccurrence of cancer caused even greater confusion. I resumed chemotherapy and did more tests. The cancer is now growing and getting worse. Unfortunately, the chemo drugs are no longer effective in my abdomen, and surgery is not an option due to the degraded state of my liver. Medically speaking, there is nothing more for me, and medically speaking, I probably will not live to 2011. The Bible says in Matthew 7:11 that God gives good things to those who ask. God cannot give me a bad gift. And it is through that lens that I can say that cancer is the best thing that has ever happened to me. 
I am a better husband and a better dad, a better boss and a better employee, a better friend and a better follower of Jesus. And through cancer, God has shown me some amazing things about himself. Those are indeed great gifts. I still have questions about cancer, why it went away and why it came back. I do not understand, but I know that God is in charge. I am praying for God to heal me. That is my desire. I want to walk my daughter Lizzie down the aisle. I want to watch my sons, Jake and Luke, become men. I want to grow old with Mandy, and I want to live my life with my friends here at work. But I may not be able to work for very much longer, and I may have just celebrated my last Christmas with my family. This I do know. If God chooses to heal me, then God is God and God is good. If God chooses not to heal me and allows me to die, God is still God and God is still good. To God be the glory. was raised from the dead. If you read the end of the story, you see Jesus prays to the Father, stone is rolled away and Lazarus walks out. Zach Smith died. May of 2010. Not every story is happy. Not every story ends up the way that we want. Expect the unexpected. God can do anything. But in everything, you have a champion. I want to read chapter 11, 25 to 26 again. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Zach Smith lives in the presence of Jesus. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe? Do you believe? Can the worship team come up? The story of Zach reminds me of the shortness of life. It reminds me to take advantage of every day that I have. And most of all, it reminds me that God is here. He is here. He is alive. And I want to live my life knowing and experiencing the presence of God daily because he is here. Don't miss out. Imagine, imagine your life as if you lived every minute in the presence of God. Every temptation you face, God is here. When, when sickness comes your way, I have a champion. When death comes your way, I have a champion. When, when, you, when you get the phone call and, and your son or your, 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 your child was in an accident, God can do anything. He is here. When, when you think of, of, of your son or, or your spouse or, or, or your closest friend and, and, and they're far from God and you're going, man, I wish they would come to know Jesus. Man, I wish they... God can do anything. 
Expect the unexpected. Imagine, people, a person, and, and then imagine a family that lives like God is here all the time. In our house, in our life, in our school. No matter where we go, God is here. And then, and then picture this, people. Imagine a church. You know what I'm saying? Imagine a church that lives like God is here. That he can do anything. That he can do anything beyond what we can even imagine. Imagine a community of followers of Jesus who live like that. It says that the gates of Hades cannot hold the church. Let's be a church like that. Let's be a church where we're not limited by, by what we see, by, by, by what we think we can do. By, 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 by. Let, let's live as a church, as families, as people that, that God is here. And, and therefore, the, there's a difference in the way we act and behave and the way we talk. Let's live it. We're just going to close with this last song. And my heart, my heart for you is that you'll just surrender those things that you're holding so tightly to. Uh, it, it could be a view of God, that you view God right now as this person who kind of looks down and you're like, oh, I, I can't do that because God's looking down at me and, oh, you know, all this kind of stuff. It, it, it could be that you're going through a situation where you're just, it's just tough times, you've lost your job, your child's sick, you're sick, something's going on. Lay it at his feet. Lay it at his feet. It, it could be a sin that you've been struggling through and, and you're going, man, how am I going to get victory over this thing? Lay it at his feet. Just surrender, surrender your life to him because God is here.